Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you just now asking that you would be here in a special way. Father, I pray that you would encourage us and challenge us and spur us on to maybe, maybe a challenge in our walk, something new. Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Howard Rutledge had been on the USS Bonhomme uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin, and he had flown up in his fighter jet, and he was flying over North Korea. As he was flying over North Korea, his plane was struck. As it was struck, he realized the plane was going down, and so he ejected. So as he went shooting out of the top of the airplane and his parachute opened, he turned back to look at the plane that he had just seconds before flown out of, and as he looked back, it just exploded. And so he realized his life was saved within, you know, seconds. His life was spared. And, and he ended up coming down, and now he's over North Korea at this point during the Korean conflict. And you can imagine in this situation, as he's coming down, uh, he, the, the dip, you know, recognizing, okay, if you're coming down over a jungle, well, hopefully you don't get hung up in a tree or whatever it may be. But the difficulty is he's not coming down over the jungle. He's coming down over a town, and there's people everywhere. So there's no escape. It's clear there is no escape. He, he lands, and, and within moments, he's captured, he, he's beaten, he's stripped of his clothing, and he's thrown into prison. He is later taken into a prison camp. He may, ends, in, uh, ends up in the Hanoi Hilton, actually. And as he, as he does, he's in this situation, and he's thrown into uh, what we call solitary confinement, meaning absolutely, utterly alone. And he ended up being there. He was in prison for seven years. Five of those years, five of those years, he was in solitary confinement. And notice, notice what he said. This is absolutely fascinating to me. He said, it's, it is hard to describe what solitary confinement can do to unnerve and defeat a man. You quickly tire of standing up or sitting down, sleeping or being awake. There are no books, no paper or pencils, no magazines or newspapers. The only colors you see are drab gray and dirty brown. Months or years may go by when you don't see the sunrise or the moon, green grass or flowers. You are locked in alone in your silent little filthy cell, breathing stale, rotten air and trying to keep your sanity. He went on to say, in prison, I discovered how important regular times of reflection can be. Living in America, one becomes preoccupied with family and career. When I was free, I seldom thought seriously about what I was doing or why I was doing it. When days are filled with travel, conversation, books, papers, movies, televisions, meals, radios, billboards, and I can say iPods, iPads, and you know, internet and whatever, he says, and the like, the mind is constantly looking outward and dealing with the world outside and around. But when suddenly all that is taken away, it is forced to deal with the world inside. He said, now the sights and sounds and smell of death were all around me. My hunger for spiritual food soon outdid my hunger for a steak. I tried desperately to recall snatches of scripture, sermons and gospel choruses from childhood and hymns we sang in church. How I struggled to recall those scriptures and hymns. I had spent my first 18 years in a Southern Baptist Sunday school, and I was amazed at how much I, I could recall. Regrettably, I had not seen the importance of memorizing verses from the Bible or learning gospel songs. Now when I needed them, it was too late. I never dreamed that I would spend almost seven years, five of them in solitary confinement in a prison in North Vietnam, or that thinking about one memorized verse could have made a whole day bearable. One portion of a verse I did memorize was, Thy word have I hid in my heart. How often I wished I had worked to hide God's word in my heart. We have a picture here of a man who had been in solitary confinement for five years, not able to converse with people. And you can imagine the difficulty. It literally was all they could do to keep their sanity in this situation. This man, he looked back on this situation. What I find fascinating, you know, growing up in a, in a Baptist Sunday school, he didn't know the future. He didn't know what was going to happen in his life. And so he didn't prepare for it. When he went in to, you know, the Air Force, he never would have expected 
When he went into service, he never would have expected that he would be cast into prison and he would be seeking and searching to, to grasp onto the word of God, but much of it would be gone because he hadn't stored it up in his mind and in his heart. He wouldn't have God's word in this situation. Yes, he had, and he was excited that for the several verses that, that he could recall. But he said, oh, that I wished I would have taken the time to store up God's word in my mind and in my heart. And this young man, he didn't know the future. But the fact is, if we know prophecy, we do know the future. We recognize that there, there is a future that awaits us, and it could be that we will not have the scriptures during that time period. And are we not going to be ready? Could we in the same way say, oh, I had no idea? The fact is, we do know. We do know the future, and God is calling us to be ready. And we're going to look at Bible memorization over the centuries. If you go back in time, uh, we, we, we looked at the fact that uh, back in Israel, you had these men and women that in the very beginning that they would teach in the very beginning of the Jewish nation as they would teach their children. Uh, at least during the time of Moses, they would begin to store up the word of God in the minds of their children. They, so the Israelites, they would have much of the Old Testament memorized. That was a given in ancient Israel. So in the Old Testament times, it was, the co it was common for God's people to store up God's mind, God's word in their minds and in their hearts. But what we see here is that when we come to the New Testament, what about Jesus? What's fascinating is when you look at Jesus, the majority of the time where he was using the scriptures, he was quoting them. Seventy-eight times we see Jesus quoting the Old Testament. And Jesus himself quoted 27 different books from the Old Testament. So you can tell that Jesus had stored up. He took it seriously. And once again, someone says, well, didn't he do that because he, you know, he was God? Well, once again, no, the, yes, it, yes, he was God, but he had to learn scriptures in the same way that we do, because it says there in Luke chapter 2, the very last verse of the chapter, it tells us that Jesus increased in stature and wisdom and when, in favor with God and man. Jesus increased in wisdom, meaning he had to learn in the same way that we have to learn. So Jesus stored up the word of God in his mind and in his heart as a child and as he grew because he knew that in this life that humans live, there are trials, there are temptations, there are tribulations, and we are going to go through difficulties. And Jesus stored up the word of God in his mind and in his heart for the future. We come down then, and what about after Jesus? Jesus died, and he raised up the church of the New Testament with the apostles. And as Jesus raised, we look in the book of Acts, and I just did a quick cursory you know, check through the, through the book of Acts, and you see no less than 40 different verses being quoted by the apostles in, in the book of Acts. So no less than 40 times the apostles are quoting, 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 quoting the word of God, because to them, just like their master, just like their Lord, Jesus, he had stored up God's word in his mind and in his heart, so too his disciples followed suit. They did the same thing. If this is the way your master has lived, in the same way you ought to live. And so they had stored up the word of God and they would share it. They would share the spoken word of the gospel to people as they were witnessing. And this was the common thing that we would see there right in the book of Acts. So it seems that it was a norm for the apostolic church in the very beginning, the church of the apostles, to have the word of God stored up in your mind and in your heart. Now, what happened just after, you know, these men died and we come to the early church, we're looking at the history of this and what we read here from a book called The Ancient Church, it's, it's History, Doctrine, and Worship. We read the husband and wife talked of them, speaking of the Bible, the scriptures, the husband and wife talked of them familiarly as they sat by the domestic hearth and children were accustomed to commit them to memory. As many of the disciples could not read, and as the expense of manuscripts was considerable, copies of the sacred books were not in the hands of all. But the, their frequent rehearsal in public assemblies made the multitude familiar with their contents. And some of the brethren possessed an amount of acquaintance with them, which even at the present day would be deemed marvelous. So you see that in the early church that it was customary for people to raise their children up, just like the Hebrews in the Old Testament, that the children 
children would be storing up the Word of God in their minds and in their hearts, that husbands and wives would talk of them. It was a common thing for them to do, that it was just part of the early church to store up God's Word from, from a child upward and talk about them, to share them with your family, that the man and the woman in the house would share these things together. So the, not only in the Old Testament, not only Jesus, not only the, the apostles, but the early church would store up God's Word in their minds and in their hearts. We come down to Tertullian, which was one of the church fathers. And notice, when speaking of this man, it says Tertullian, he was an early Christian theologian uh, from A.D. 160 to 240, the great church father devoted days and nights to memorizing the scriptures and got much of them by heart so accurately that he knew the very punctuation of them. So you look, the early church, the people within the church would store up the word of God in their minds and in their hearts. That was just a common thing that you would see individuals because, you know, it wasn't always as easy as it is today to have, you know, a nice, you know, several, you know, 10 Bibles in your bedroom or whatever. But men and women would store it up so that at all times they would have God's word with them in their possession, in their mind. We come down, after the early church, we come down to the Waldenses, who I believe also were actually apostolic Christians. But these men, were also called the Vadoi, and they were the people of the valleys. That's what their name means, the people of the valleys. Now these people uh, were faithful to God. They loved the Word of God. They, they stored it up in their minds and in their hearts. And when you look back on the history of the Waldenses, what they would do is they knew that the church at that time, that it was, a, it was considered a crime to own the Word of God. Not amongst the Waldensian church, but at the church at large. It was a crime to own a copy of the Scriptures in your own tongue. And they had it in their own language. And so the the church would do anything they could to put a stop to that. And so what would happen was the Waldenses would, they had their copies of the scriptures and they would decide within the town, they would say, John, your children will know, uh, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And your children so-and-so will memorize the next five books. And, and literally they would go through and the children would have the entire Bible memorized together so that if someone came into town, destroyed all of their Bibles, took all of their Bibles away, they could just gather their children together. And they could have the Word of God once again. They could recite it back and they'd have the Word of God once again in their own language. So they would not be separated from it. These people loved the Word of God. I could go on with stories about these men and women. They were godly men and women. They clung by faith to the Scriptures. Now notice this, we read here in Ecclesiastical Empire by A.T. Jones, speaking of the Waldenses, it says, But their crowning offense was their love and reverence for the Scripture. And their burning zeal in making converts. The inquisitor of Passau informs us that they had translations of the whole Bible in the vulgar tongue, which the church vainly sought to suppress, and which they studied with incredible assiduity. He knew... He knew a peasant who could recite the book of Job word for word. Many of them had the whole of the New Testament by heart. And simple as they were, were dangerous disputants. A disciple of ten days standing would seek out another whom he could instruct. And when the dull and untrained brain would fain abandon the task in despair, they would speak words of encouragement, learn a single word or a verse a day. And in a, in a year... Learn a single word or verse a day, and in a year you will know 300, and thus you will gain in the end. Notice as, as one of them was instructing another in the Bible, he knew the necessity of having God's word stored in your mind and in your heart. And as understanding this, uh, they would encourage one who was struggling maybe to store up God's word in his mind and in his heart. And that word, you know, gather one word a day. Well, what does that mean? You know, the, the Ten Commandments were called uh, the Ten Words. Not that the Ten Commandments were literally ten words, but that was an example of what? It was a sentence or a verse. And so he said, you know, memorize just a verse a day. And in a year, you know, he used the term 300, obviously 365. You'll have 365 and you'll gain in the end. So the Waldensian challenge was to at least gather up a word a day, a, a verse a day, store them up in your mind and your hearts. And as you're storing them up, they'll, you know, you'll have more in the end and you'll have something to comfort, strengthen you in the times of trial. And these men and women, they knew trials. They knew tribulation. Now, 
we look at this, these men bring us to the time of what we would call the Dark Ages, the Waldenses. But we come down to, with, through these men, they stored up the Word of God. They loved the Word of God. It was everything to them. They would, uh, many of them would have at least some of the Gospels memorized, like the Gospel of John, and uh, some, of, some of the epistles and so forth. They would store up the Word of God. They would have it with them. They would go throughout Europe, and they would secretly, they would, they would inscribe it on paper, and they would go around as what they called coal porters. And they would, they would share different wares and so forth, and they would have in, hidden in their coat a, a small parchment of paper that they would actually, you know, when they were trying to sell their things, if they found an individual who was open, they would secretly bring it out to them that no one would know, so they could bring the word of life, the word of God to somebody. They cared for the word of God. God was paramount in their lives, and they clung to his word. But when we come down to the time of the Reformation, do you think about this? The Reformation, Martin Luther, with with Martin Luther, the Reformation began with the memory verse. The Reformation began with the memory verse. You say, really? Now, we know there were people before Luther, like Haas and so forth. But nevertheless, with, with Luther himself, we discover that as he was climbing up the stairs, what are called Pilate's staircase, I've seen them there in Rome. He was climbing up the staircase. People are still climbing them on their knees today over in Rome. You can go see them. And Luther, as he was climbing up those stairs, trying to find salvation, trying to find peace, uh, you know, that he can maybe get out of purgatory a number of years, according According to the traditions, uh, as he was climbing up, a memory verse flashed through his mind in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, which tells us the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so Luther, as this memory verse flashed through his mind, he got up and then he, we read here that Luther himself, Luther knew so much of the Bible from memory that the, when the Lord opened his eyes to see the truth of justification in Romans 1.17, he said, thereupon I ran through the scriptures from memory in order to confirm what he had found. Meaning as that word flashed into his mind, as the text flashed into his mind that the just shall live by faith, he thought, well, I need to compare Scripture with Scripture to make sure I understand this accurately. And so he began running through the Scriptures in his memory. And it was because this was this seed, the seed of the Word of God that sprang up in the heart of Martin Luther that bring about the Reformation. If it were not for Martin Luther clinging to the Word of God so much that he was memorizing it, we wouldn't have had him coming up and, and beginning the Reformation. The Lord would have used somebody else, but at that time it was a memory verse that started the Reformation. We go forward. We, we see the importance of Bible memorization. We see it. Uh, one of the importance of it is that we are born again by the Word of God, as 1 Peter 1, 23 says. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. The text says we are born again by the Word of God. God's Word is everything to us. And if we store it up in our mind and in our hearts as we contemplate it, as we meditate upon it, as we talk to God about it through our prayers, through our connection, and through our abiding in Him, we are changed and we are born again by the Word of God. The Word is so very important to us. It is everything to us. We look and we can see, looking back, that it was important to God's people in the Old Testament to store his word up in their minds and in their hearts. What they actually considered the written word to be just the basis of what they were memorizing. So that was the basis of what they could store in their minds and in their hearts. We come down to Jesus in the New Testament, 78 times sharing, you know, quoting the word of God. We see time and time again when we come down to the Acts, we see 40 times they share it there. We come down to the, after the apostles, we see it in the early church. It was a given down to the Waldenses, these men and women in, they were day by day storing up God's word in their minds and in their hearts. And we come down to the time that we live in. And we look actually just back in some of the, some of the wars that Gene, actually it's interesting, this brother's name is Gene War. He was an old businessman. He's, he's passed away now. But he was a, he was a businessman and, uh, you know, had done v- very, very successful man. Very successful man. He also had been in World War II. He helped kick the Nazis out of Czechoslovakia as a soldier back then in World War II. And Gene War was a, an avid Bible memorizer. And he, he stored up the mind, word of God in his mind and in his heart. And this man shares a story that after the Korean conflict, they had done studies to try to discover what is it that when certain individuals who are under, you know, they've been taken captive, some of them crack and give up and others stay firm and stay strong. And so they tried to discover 
what are some of the characteristics that we can see in those individuals? What are some of the things in their lives that keep them from cracking or giving up? And Gene War tells the story that as they studied out uh, after the Korean conflict that they discovered that there were two major things that they saw. Number one, those who didn't crack under these trials were those who had strong moral and religious convictions. And number two, those who had memorized God's word and repeated and went through it in their mind. What a fascinating thought. That these men who, who were storing up God's mind in their, in, their, in their mind, storing up God's word in their minds and in their hearts, they were not overcome. They found victory. They clung to the word of God. They were abiding by faith in the word of God, and that gave them the victory. That gave them the victory. Their faith in the word as they were clinging to Jesus Christ, it gave something for them to think about. It gave them something to meditate upon. And they were strengthened by the word of God. What a thought. This was their experience that they were storing up that word. And actually, they, you see that time and time again. I've read book after book. on. I'm kind of fascinated with these books about people who've been you know, in war or been in uh, you know, concentration camps and how they stayed faithful during those time periods. And as you read those stories, one of the common denominators you see amongst Christians that remain faithful in these situations is the word of God. They were storing up the word of God. They, they had it in their mind and in their heart. And in the trials, they would think it through. They would, many of the Psalms for them would be memorized. They would know some Psalms like, you know, Psalms chapter 1 or Psalms 23 or Psalms 91. And they had stored these texts up in their minds and in their hearts. You know, they would think of things like Psalms 23 where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And they would go through these texts, and you can imagine God as your shepherd, that he's taking care of you. Even in these difficulties, they would come down later in the chapter where they would read, He prepareth a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. He prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Uh, he anointeth my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can imagine them as they're thinking about these. Yea, though I walk earlier in the chapter, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. You can imagine these texts that have been burned into the mind can strengthen and comfort these individuals during their intense trials and tribulations, separated from family, separated from friends, separated from everyone, but no one could efface from them the word of God that had been stored in their minds and in their hearts. Have you thought about that? Someone can take away your iPod with all your verses on it, Somebody can take away your computer. Somebody can take away your Bible. But nobody can take away the word of God that has been etched upon your mind and upon your heart. God has given us this word, his word, to have in our hearts. Actually, that's one of the commands in the Bible, right? We, we see that in, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. God has given us his word. He has given it to us to be in our hearts. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It's no, it's no uh, surprise then that those soldiers who stayed faithful were the ones who had God's word stored in their heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. They, they remained faithful because of God's word. They clung to the Savior through his word and no one can take away the word that has been stored in our minds and in our hearts. We can go over this over and over and over. A text here from Manuscript Releases, page 20, Manuscript Releases, 64 of 1906, it says, The time will come when many will be deprived of the written word. But if this word is printed in the memory, no one can take it from us. The time will come where many will be deprived of the word. That means maybe some won't be deprived. But many will. Are we going to take the chance and say, I hope I'm a part of that group that you know, has it? I hope, sure. I hope I have the you know, uh, Bible in my pocket for the rest of my life, right? But the reality is we see that the time will come when many will be deprived of the written word. 
But if we have it burned and etched into our minds and in our hearts, nobody can take it from us. We can have the word of God. We can trust in the word of God and we can know that he is with us. And I'll tell you this, from a personal experience, it has been such a blessing to me. Uh, and I can tell you also, it was very difficult in the beginning to store up the Word of God in your mind and in, in your heart. But I can say this, and I know it to be a fact, that as you do it, it actually, in the beginning, it's hard. Unless you're good at it. I, I've run into people who are very good at it. Um, but the reality is, many times the people who are good at it don't stick to it. They could. They could just store up tons of it. But they, many, many times people who are very talented at something aren't very successful at it because they don't put the effort into it because it's easy. Many times it's the people who really aren't that good at it. I was not very good at it, actually. But I just continue to store and continue to go over these things. And I'll tell you this, it is the, uh, the repetition that truly deepens the impression. Uh, the, the fact that you're going over day after day and month after month and year after year that it actually sticks in your mind. If I just memorize something today and I don't memorize, look at it for a week, it's gone, right? But it's the repetition going over these things. But I can say this. That many people have found that if, if there's one, uh, you know, spiritual experience that, that strengthens the Christian life more than many others, not necessarily more than prayer or Bible study, but one of the strongest experiences you can have in your life that encourage you and strengthens you is Bible memorization. I can say this for, for someone who wants to be a witness to other people, wants to be a minister, I can think of no better thing to enhance your witness or your sharing of the Word of God than having it stored up in your mind and in your heart. And the fact is you may say, but I don't, I, I, I don't know how to share the Bible. And it's probably because you don't know it very well. If you knew it well, if you spend time in it, if you're storing up God's Word in your mind and in your heart, you would know it. Many people like, you know, they will, you know some mechanics will know every aspect of what's under the hood of a car. And it's not like they were born that way. It's because they spent time under the hood of a car, right? If, if a you know, doctor has spent time with the human body, he knows all the different aspects of the human physiology. Somebody else who's not you know, studied that, they don't know. And someone who has spent time in the Word of God, which is, we are all called to do that, can get to know the Word of God personally so that we can be a living witness for Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge you to get to know the Word of God now, God has called us to, to be strengthened in His Word, to store it up in our minds and in our hearts. And once again, I know some people have very sensitive conscience, and if there's somebody who truly, truly does not have the capacity, the Lord understands that. But I think 99% of you could, could memorize. And I share this every time I talk about memorization, and we've seen this, we've talked about this already. Someone says, I cannot memorize. And some people really can't, but once again, if I said, in the next week, if I, if I said, I will give you $100,000 for every verse you memorize, I'll bet you could memorize at least 15 verses in the next week, right? If I told you I'll give you a million and a half dollars for uh, each, you know, I mean, for memoriz memorizing 15 verses in the next week, I'll bet you every single one of you could run home and do it, right? You may think you're, I don't have the ability to do it, but when there's, when the money's on the line, I'll bet you could do it, right? You'd have no problem at that point. You know you could do it then, right? If we had big barrels of cash sitting up here, you know, uh, Bill Gates or some wealthy person is here and he's, you know, got money here and he says, hey, I'll, I'll give you the money if you, if you, if you can memorize some verses. I guarantee you could do it. It is all about, it is not about, do you have the mental capacity? There's a, yeah, sure, there's 1% of people who maybe can't, but the rest of the 99%, it's not about having the mental to capacity to do it. It is about having the motivation to do it. Are you motivated? Do you recognize the spiritual benefits of spending time with God in His Word? So much so that in times of temptation, you have a verse. In times of tribulation, you have a verse. Whether it's temptation or tribulation, or whether it's times of sorrow, times of depression. Whether it's times of joy, whether it's times to encourage somebody else. Whether it's having a word in season to him that is weary. We can have the Word of God. We can be in possession of the Word of God, and nobody, nobody can take that away from us if we are clinging to the Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to challenge you to give this a try, to spend time in the Word of God. We, we read there in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, think about that. There are different ways you can memorize, one of which it says there, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, the psalms were actually to be sung, and spiritual songs, it's a wonderful thing that these men that were imprisoned, one of the things, this man Howard Rutledge we read about, one of the things that encouraged him was, was old hymns that he could remember. As he was going back and remembering some of those hymns, those beautiful words encouraged him. So we can let the Word of God, you know, encourage us through things like, you know, uh, hymns from church or whatever, but the Psalms themselves uh, were meant to be sung. And you can actually go online and you can buy some of these CDs out there. You know, people have made Scripture songs. And these Scripture songs make it much easier for many of us. It's much e it's easier for us to memorize through song than it is just through you know repetition of the written word. So you can look into you know music and these kind of things. The other thing I'll tell you just a simple way that I've learned to memorize. Very simple, no grand technique, but it's just to simply read a text through a verse, just one verse, over ten times, just right through one, two, three, four, five. You know, uh, I'll give you. An, let's pick a text. Uh, we could say, you know, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks, now, but thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've memorized the next verse also, but let's just say 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. So you read it through again. Uh, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. And say the verse with it each time, so that every time you say it, they're connected. Those are together, so you don't forget where it's found. Now, if you forget where it's found, at least you have the Word of God stored in your heart. It, didn't, it wasn't originally given with chapter and verse, but it's a blessing if you do know what it is. It just kind of adds to it, because you can go back and look at it. You can study the context, which I would challenge you to do every time you memorize a verse. Know the context so that you, you're making sure you're understanding accurately what you're quoting. But go over it ten times. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God. Ten times reading it. And then right after that, try to quote it ten times. Now, if you can't quote it after ten times of reading it, you have to do a few more times. And then go over it ten times from memory. And then, you know, through the day, you can pull it out of your pocket. You put it on a little card, and you can pull it out of your pocket during the day, and, and you can, you know, go over it again or go over it before you go to bed. But I'll tell you this. Typically, the next day, I don't remember the verse that I memorized the day before. So then I have to go over it 10 more times that day. And then every day after that, I have to go over it one time for about 60 days. And you say, That's, that takes a ton of time. But think about this. How much time does it take me to say 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory... Sorry. But thanks, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how long does that take? I mean, it takes literally three seconds. But yes, obviously, if you have 60 verses taken up, it'll take you, you know, three, four, five minutes, 10 minutes at most. But the point is, you could do it, you know, uh, while you're doing other things during the day. You could be going through it, uh, you know, if you're riding in the car with somebody, you could sit there going over some verses. The point is, uh, it, yes, it takes up some time. But think of how much of a blessing it ends up being to have God's Word stored in your mind, in your heart, so that no one can take it away from you. John 15, verse 7 tells us, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, there's a special spiritual experience when you abide in Jesus through his word. Coming to Jesus and saying, Father, you told me. Heavenly Father, you told me through your word. You said, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. You said that you have given me the victory. And I trust in you because you promised this. In times of trouble, in the last days, God has given us messages. He's told us that in the very last days, the test will be, we will not be able to buy or sell if we are faithful to God, if we have faith in Jesus and we keep the Ten Commandments, including the fourth one, that we will not be able to buy or sell. That being the case, we have to trust in Him during these trials. And if we have word, the Word of God to encourage us during that time, it strengthens us within the trial. Jesus had stored up words in His mind and in His heart when He was a child that prepared Him. The Word of God prepared Him for the trial so that when He was in the wilderness temptation three times, three passages He quoted from Deuteronomy. On the cross, three times Jesus quoted the Word of God to, as He's clinging to the, to the Father in His cross experience as He's dying for the sins of the world. He is quoting the Word of God. Out of His seven statements on the cross, three of them were there quoting from the Old Testament. Jesus used the Word of God. If Jesus used the Word of God to prepare Him for tribulation, ought not we do the same? 
Jesus is calling us to a deeper experience with Him. In our walk with Him, the Word of God is one of the most powerful things we can have stored in our minds and in our hearts. Because I'll tell you this. I look back on my life, and in my past experience, I probably have thousands of songs in my head memorized almost word for word that are filled with filth, with things totally of the world. And I wish, if I could, you know, flip a switch, I'd love to just, you know, erase them, right? If I could do just a, you know, clean the hard drive of those old filthy songs, I would love to do that. And so sometimes, you know, you wake up in the morning and you haven't heard that song in forever, years, and boom, there it is in your head again. Now, we can use the Word of God to overpower these other thoughts. Somebody else, for you, it may not be music. Maybe it's a memory of some terrible thing, abuse that happened to you in the past. And when the thought comes back, you just go over it and over it and over it and over it. Or the music comes in your head and you go over it and over it and over it. And you're like, this isn't of God. I don't want that. But we just go over and over it. But we can choose by the act of our will to turn away from the old repetitive negative memories, the angry thoughts, the painful thoughts, and the, you know, the music or whatever. We can turn away from them and we can go over God's word in our mind. And I can tell you that even having whole chapters, after memorizing the book of Mark, one of the things I can say is that I have learned more from the book of Mark when I have been out shoveling snow, I have learned more from the book of Mark when I'm out sh- you know, mowing the lawn than I have when I've actually sat and studied it you know, in, in the bedroom with the Bible in hand. When I actually have time, when I'm doing other work, if you have a manual labor type job, you can have God's word in your heart and you can, you can be studying it while you're working, right? You can be ruminating over it. You can be cogitating on the things of the word of God. You can be meditating upon the word of God as you are out about the day doing other things. And even when you're, you know, standing in the grocery line, you could be going over your verses, you can storing, you could redeem the time. As it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, you can redeem the time because the days are evil. You can use the time instead of, oh, look, going on Facebook and finding out that John just had a hamburger, right? Instead of just saying, oh, look, Stacy just got done exercising. You can either be doing that or you could say, you know what, I ought to store up God's word in my mind and in my heart. I ought to redeem the time because the days are evil. In closing, they tell the story of a Waldensian woman who had loved the word of God. And she actually, her friend also was a faithful Waldensian and she was caught. And remember, it was a crime. The church considered it a crime if you had the word of God in the vulgar tongue or in your own tongue. This Waldensian uh, young lady, her friend was caught with a Bible. And as she was caught with the Bible, she would not recant. And so as a result, they took her to burn her at the stake. And she had, she had come, and as they lit the flames, she ended up, uh, this young lady, as she walked away, her friend was burned to death there for her faith in the Word of God. And this young lady, as she walked away, she began to think about her, her own personal love for the Word of God. And at some point, she made the decision. She said, I will never marry a young man who does not love the Word of God like I do. And I would challenge each and every one of you, have the same thought of the Waldens. You never marry someone, ever, who does not have the same faithful beliefs that you do. You don't do that. The Bible says, not, be, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But nevertheless, this young lady made that decision. And one day she actually met a young Waldensy who loved the word of God just as much as she did. And they, over time, they ended up being married. They ended up having a child. That child grew, and that child, at this point, was about around 10 or 12 years old. And they had, they were in possession of the entirety of Scripture. And you can imagine how much joy that would bring to the heart of an individual. I mean, having your own Bible, right? And these people loved the Bible so much, so this woman, her desire actually was to memorize the entire Bible. And so she would memorize day after day as she was working around the house, as she was kneading bread, as she was going about her chores of the day, she would be memorizing scripture. She had the Bible laid out there on the table and she would study it. She would memorize it. And she was, you know, stored up in her mind and in her heart because she knew the day could come. And as a matter of fact, the day did come. And actually this day, as she was literally, this day she was kneading bread in her house. She was working on the bread and her daughter was there. You know, her 12-year-old daughter was there with her and she's kneading bread. She's getting the bread all ready. And as, as she's working on the bread with uh, almost out of nowhere, she hears and boom, they, she hears them and they burst right through the door. And as they burst in through the door, the young lady, they, you know, the daughter there, she looks and she sees the soldiers and she knows it's over with. We are dead. There, we, there is no hope for us. 
They burst in and they come in. They say, we hear there's, there's word around town that you have a Bible in your house. And the woman, she just looked to them and she said, you're welcome to look through the whole house. And the daughter knew the Bible was right there behind her on the table, but she didn't even dare to turn around and look at it because she was so terrified. And these soldiers came in with their swords and they began to, you know, pierce through their mattress and, and rip up the floorboards and, and pull, you know, knock the bed over and knock tables over. And, I mean, literally, they were just destroying the house. And as they were going point by point, went up into the loft, they went everywhere and, and they couldn't find it. And finally they walked in and they, they came down and they, they opened up the wood stove to check because maybe she had just thrown it in the fire. And she, they looked and there was just some you know, bread cooking on the coals. They said, ah, it must have, been a, must have been a false report. And they stormed out of the house. And the little daughter was literally horrified. And she turned around to look and the Bible was gone. What on earth happened? There wasn't enough time to do anything with it. And she said, Mom, what happened? And she said, shh, we'll talk about it later. Well, later that day, they were trying to fix up the house as much as possible, but the husband came home before they could have the house totally fixed, and he could tell, I mean, there was no question. The house had been ransacked. It was in disarray. And she said, you know, before we finish up cleaning everything up, let's just, let's just eat together. And so they sit down at their table together, and she puts the food out and puts the bread out. And, and the husband grabbed the knife and grabbed the loaf of bread, and he began, you know, just, just about ready to cut anyway. And his wife said, no, 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 please. She said, can, can I cut the bread tonight? And as she did, she took that loaf of bread and she took that knife and ever so gingerly she began to cut away at that bread. And as she was cutting away at the bread, she pulled out a Bible that was in perfect condition. And he said, what on earth happened? And she began to relay the story. She said, you know, it must have been an angel. She said, because I don't even, I, I didn't even have the mental capacity to do this. But as they, as they entered into the house, it, I wasn't even thinking, but my hands just were taking the, the dough and they just went to the Bible, wrapped it, around the, wrapped it around the Bible. And as they were coming in, I was putting the bread in the oven. With the tin around it, I was putting it in the oven. And as they came in, I shut the oven and, and they came and ransacked the house. And they even came and looked in the oven and sure enough, just bread, just bread in the oven. And they rejoiced because they now truly had, they could keep the word of God and she could go on with that process of memorizing God's word. The Waldensies loved the word of God. I would say more than any generation outside of the apostles, the Waldensies loved the word of God. Friends, from the beginning of time in the Old Testament, God's men and women stored up the word of God in their minds and in their hearts. When we come to Jesus 78 times, he quotes the Bible in the New Testament. That's 78 times he's quoting the word of God. You come to the Acts of the Apostles, the book, the book of Acts in the New Testament, and at least 40 times, no less than 40 verses, I should say, no less than 40 verses are quoted by the apostles themselves. Then we come to the New Testament church, and it was, it was a given in the New, New Testament church that the followers of Jesus would store up his mind in their, in, store up his word in their minds and in their hearts. We come down to the Middle Ages and the Waldensies, those who could have the word of God stored it up also. Then we look down to, you know, 17, 18, and even maybe the early 1900s. Seemingly up at least until the world wars and Korean conflict and so forth. Men and women churches, different denominations. It was kind of a given that many men and women would store up psalms and texts in their minds and in their hearts. But then you come to the latter half of the 20th century and we became abnormal. We changed. We no longer saw that it was necessary. Especially when you come down to the time of the computer when people could have the internet, when they can have their iPhone and their iPod, and we can have the Word of God at any time. So who needs to store it up in your mind and in your heart? The Bible, the, my phone knows everything I need to know. But the reality is, we have been told, the time will come when many will be deprived of the Word of God. But if we have the Word stored, burned into our minds, nobody can take it away from us. I want to challenge you. We saw that these Waldensies, they made the challenge. Someone, I've made the challenge before, but I want to make it again. 
Somebody else may be hearing this for the first time, and I want to I give you the challenge. Now, maybe someone cannot do a massive memorization. You know, you, you're not ready for some massive memorization, you know, study and, and getting right into a plan like that. But maybe you can say, over the next two months, I want to memorize two verses per day. Not per day, two verses per week. Over the next two months, you say, I want to memorize two verses per week. I want to challenge you to do that. Maybe there's someone who wants to make a decision to do just that. Store up two texts of Scripture per week for the next two months. But maybe there's somebody who wants, and I don't expect everybody to do this. This is a heavy challenge. Maybe there's somebody who wants to take the Waldensian challenge, that we read, learn a single verse or a single word a day. And in a year you will know 300, and thus you will gain in the end. Maybe somebody wants to take the Waldensian challenge. I know this is heavy, and I know most people are not ready for this, but there may be someone who wants to say, you know, I want to do that. I want God's Word to be with me in a very special way here today, helping me with the trials, the tribulations, there with me in the joys and in the sorrows now, but also in preparation for the future. Maybe there's someone who'd like to take the Waldensian challenge to memorize a verse a day for the next year. 365 verses in a year. What an experience to have the Word of God like that stored in your mind and in your hearts. Maybe someone would like to make the first decision. Two texts per week for the next two months. Maybe you'd like to make that decision. Or maybe there's somebody else who wants to say, I want to take the Waldensian challenge. Friends, I want to challenge you. It is, it is between you and the Lord, storing up the Word of God in your mind and in your heart. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your Word. It is everything to us, for without it we would not know the way of eternal life. There was a time, and a time is still now. Many people say, oh, God would never allow us people to go through tribulation. What would we say to the Chinese who have died and suffered for their faith in China? God wouldn't allow you to go through tribulation. We could never say that to those in China. We can never say to those in the Middle East, the faithful Christians who are dying in the Middle East for their faith, we can never say God would never allow you to go through tribulation because God does. And we couldn't say to Jesus, you would never go through tribulation because he himself went through tribulation. The apostles went through tribulation. Throughout the church, throughout the years of God's church on earth, his people have gone through trials. They've gone through tribulation. But they had stored up your word in their minds and in your hearts, in their hearts. And Father, we also recognize the reality that whether we, whether we live to the very end or in the absolute, you know, time of trouble, we do go through tribulations today. We go through temptations and struggles and trials today. And your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Your word gives us strength. It gives us victory. And Father, my prayer is that we will store up your word, that it would be the center of our lives as we're, uh, we're abiding and clinging to the vine, as we're holding on to Jesus, that as, like he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. John 15, verse 7. And Father, may we have that experience that it talks about in Colossians 3.16. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. May we experience what it says in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou good, have good success. Father, we recognize we will have a spiritual, successful life if we are abiding in you through your word day by day. We're not talking about prosperity, gospel. We're talking about having a prosperous, spiritual life. Father, may we have that experience. May we take time in your word. For we know that if, if we are not taking that time to spend in your word... If we're not spending time with you in your word on a daily basis, reading it and praying about it and studying it, we can't expect that you will bring it to our minds when the time of trial arises. We thank you for for your strength, Father, and that you are the one who can open our mind to do this. You can strengthen our mind to do this. We don't have the strength, but you do. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.